Hello, good afternoon. So I am sick, I have a cold, and I'm hoping that nothing funny will happen as I do this live video. And I should be happy because now the government has reduced medical doctor's fees by 20%. It's a directive from the Ministry of Health, 20% reduction, right? So I should be happy. Uh, just to give you an example, a normal delivery, right? Uh, it costs 72,000, this is for pregnant women, and it, it will now re be reduced to 57,600. Now remember, the government has maximum and minimum uh, expenses, like cost, the fees that doctors should, should ask for from their patients. So the maximum they had set for normal del deliveries was 72,000, now it will be 57,600. So that's just an example, right? And I think it's good for the, for the pregnant women. So, <clears throat> CC, C, Silly Karaoke said that they are doing that so that they can achieve universal healthcare. The government has been talking about that for some time. So, how bad was the situation that we actually needed this? So, I'll start with the Kenya per capita expenditure on health, right? It, stand, it stands at 17,000. Like, if you take all the amount that we spend on healthcare and you divide it by our population, everybody would be spending 17,000 17, annually. But that is not realistic because not, not all of us get sick, right? So that means that the amount being spent on healthcare, it's been spent by some people and it's a lot, right? Let me give you in terms of inflation, right? So uh, an insurance brokerage firm, it's called Minute Kenya. It did a study in 2017 and this is what it found. General inflation, right, in Kenya was at 8.202%. Medical inflation was at 12%. Now, what we do when it comes to inflation is that we take a basket of goods. The most important ones are fuel and food. And then we, we, get, the, we get the general inflation, like by what percentage did the goods increase, by what amount, right? And then we measure them for a lot of other stuff. So anyway, <clears throat> we had medical inflation at 12% and general inflation at 8%. 8 so that means medical inflation is a bit high. Right, and guess what we had as our GDP, GDP growth in 2017? We had it at 4.9 percent, right? So inflation is higher than the growth that we are experiencing. Medical inflation is around two times, two point, let's say five times higher than uh, than the the rate of growth in the economy, right? So medicine is a big problem. People the costs are increasing far above the, the income to support those costs. And that's a problem for many people. Okay, it means that if you have a family and one of you guys falls sick, right? You guys will be spending more of your household income paying for their healthcare. And even if your income increases, right? It won't increase as fast as those medical expenses will increase, right? So now Im imagine if it's not only one family member, but it's a couple of family members. <clears throat> And that's why healthcare costs can cripple an entire family. And it's at once, just at once. Because it's likely to be more than the cash you're paying on rent, more than the cash you're paying on food. So anyway, so that was uh, <clears throat> like an overview of that. Uh, and that's why you find people asking for donations, right? Because they can't really afford it because the costs are too high. And especially when it's a complicated... Um, okay, let's say a complex or an expensive medical procedure or medical condition, then it, then you can, it will not only cripple you financially, but you just can't afford it. You've given everything and you don't have even more to give. And it affects everybody. Let me give you an example of Janet Kanini Ikwa. That was her name, right? She had stage, stage four lung cancer. Now, Janet worked for NTV. She was uh, an anchor at NTV, right? And she also worked still at NTV for Nsoko Property Show. So she was at a certain level that most people in Kenya are not, right? And she had stage four lung cancer and she could not afford it, right? They had to do an entire concert for her just to promote her. And she was at a certain level in society, right? So that's how bad, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> medical costs can get in, in Kenya, right? Janet Kanini was also an ambassador for Pampers. Just imagine how established she was in our society, but she couldn't afford the cost of lung cancer. So now imagine somebody who's, 
who doesn't have anything in Kenya. That's how bad it was. And what, how do people respond to these things? Now, when you're sick, you're sick. You have to see somebody because you, you just have to, right? Uh, in a survey, did 87.3% of uh, the people surveyed in that study, they consulted a healthcare provider when they were ill. Now, remember, a healthcare provider is not necessarily a doctor. By the US definition, it can be anybody, a nurse, a midwife, a clinical social worker, as long as they have something to do with the medical profession and they have some kind of training in the medical profession. So 87.3% of Kenyans, they consult a healthcare provider. I would have liked to know what percentage of them consult an actual doctor. Now, of those who do not seek uh, a healthcare, they, con they do not consult a healthcare provider when they're sick. Okay. They, this is what they do, right? They consider that their illness is not serious enough, so they don't have to do that. They self-medicate. Or they just say the cost is too high. Even if I go, I cannot afford it. Even the consultation, I cannot afford it. So let me just stay here with my sickness. And like uh, the Elijah story, we take this, the, like the woman who went to Elijah, right? And she said, I only have this oil and flour. I cook and I die, right? So yeah, so that's what happens. And people self-medicate. I actually hate self-medicating. Because people, they just take any medicine that's in the house and they believe that that medicine would somehow help. And that is the sad state of our society, right? That people will actually do that. They will try anything because the cost of that medical care is too high. And perhaps that's why, one of the reasons why the government came up with this thing, right? So even uh, the distance is also a, a, a factor, right? Because those who live three kilometers within a healthcare facility are more likely to seek care than those who live far away. Let's say 10 kilometers, 9 kilometers, or 4 to 5 kilometers. So that's a bit far, right? So distance also matters. And distance also matters in terms of cost. Because there's another researcher who found that if you put up, uh, let's say, a medical facilities in Kiambu, you put them enough in, uh, in those rural areas, right? You put enough medical facilities then people will stop coming to Nairobi for medical facilities and the cost of healthcare would actually reduce naturally. If you do that, so that's what this case found out. Now, what happens when this healthcare is so bad in Kenya, right? This is my, what happens? Like the life expectancy rate in uh, worldwide, it's 71 years. People are expected to live up to 71 years. And Kenya, Kenya was... Uh, 58 to 62 years in 2017 right now it's 67 years so we are four years below the life expectancy rate worldwide as in honestly we are not the poorest current country in the world there's so many poor countries but we're still at four years less than the average life expectancy so this is a big problem in the medical sector we are not a healthy nation as we would like to believe right and perhaps one of the reasons is high doctor fees. And perhaps one of the reasons to get to a good, healthy nation is like introducing, like uh, cutting their costs, like they did at 20, 20%. So <clears throat> why should people not get insurance, right? Because if you can't afford it, then perhaps the insurers will, will have afford it. So get insurance, those guys will pay for it, right? Because not all of us get sick, but they can get money from a lot of people. So we have to kind of like insurance. We have public insurance and private insurance, right? NHIF, it's the oldest government-supported insurance scheme in Africa. The oldest. And still, it only covers 11% of the population. That shows you how, how we are in terms of Africa and as a nation, right? We, this institution has been there for so long, and it only covers how many people? 11% of the population. What's the problem with it? Okay, let's go to another one, right? Let's go to... Uh, yeah, it is mandatory for guys to have NHIF, right? Uh, NHIF is voluntary for the guys in the informal sector, right? So it, how does NHIF work? It works on a co-payment system where you pay for some amount and they pay for some amount, you pay for some amount, or an insurance company pay, pays for some amount, 
So that's how it, it kind of works, right? And that's where you'll see why people still need some, some cash, even though they have NHF, the public insurance. You'll find that that's why people still need private insurance, even though they have NHF, because NHF does not pay for everything. It works on a co-payment system, right? And this is what it does. It, it pays for the basic cost of uh, that treatment. Like if you go to a hospital, it will pay for, for the bed, right? And some other stuff, but it's basically uh, the basic amount, right? Yes. You will need, uh, if you go for like to a high-end hospital where you think that the services are better at that high-end hospital, then <clears throat> you will need to foot any bill in excess of what the NHF co covers. And it covers the, the minimum, let's say the basic cost. So you still need a lot of money if, when you get sick and you want, let's say, if they have good insurance covers. So anyway, let's go to private insurance, right? They cover, according to the stats I have, uh, this I think were government stats, they cover 4% of the population, that's around 2 million people in a country of 50 million people, right? From insurance, they say that they cover 1.3 million Kenyans, which translates to 2.6% of the population. Again, this data, it needs to become coherent, right? So that's another problem that could be there. The private insurance cover will only kick in after you exhaust your NHF cover. So guys who, in the informal sector, where well, it's voluntary, right? Even if you have private insurance, when you go to a hospital, they will tell you that, like that one was NHF was supposed to cover, will not cover it. So you'll have to pay it yourself. So that's one of the importance of having NHIF, right? Even if like you're not in the formal sector. So if you're an, not an active member of NHIF, that's the thing. You'll have to cover, <clears throat> you'll have to cover the equivalent cost of what NHIF would have paid before the private insurer comes into play. It's all, it's all games. It's all games, in my opinion. So anyway, what do insurance companies say? Insurance companies says, say that insuring people is expensive in Kenya, right? Some even call it a loss-making venture. You are just surviving. And why do they say that? They say that because uh, they pay a lot of amount, right, to their insurance, to, to like the doctors, the doctor's fees and all of those things. And for drugs, they pay a lot of amount for drugs. Just to be specific, they say that pharmaceutical companies, right, like the drugs they pay for, they are the leading reason why insurance companies, they make a loss. Why insurance, insuring people is a loss-making venture, right? And just to give you an example, Madison Insurance, right, that's January 3rd, 2019, it said that it would only pay prescription claims for generic drugs. Genetic drugs are cheaper than the original drugs. And it seems that these pharmaceutical uh, drugs, they have touched Madison so much, as in hurt its bottom line so much, that it does now say that it will only pay for generic drugs. So that's how expensive it can get for them to, to cater for drugs for, for their patients. They, then they have mentioned doctor's fees as the leading cause of exorbitant medical bills. They are paying too much, according to them, for these medical bills. And doctor's fees are part of the reason why. They're the second leading reason after pharmaceutical drugs, the, the price charged for drugs, right? So insurance companies are actually hurting, and they actually want some, some relief, some reprieve from the economic burden that they are facing, right? And that's why they're supporting capping these doctor's fees. Because they give an example, right? A doctor will perform a simple procedure, just one procedure, but he'll fragment that procedure into various things so that they can get the maximum amount from, from insurance companies. That's how they, they do their thing and they get a lot of money from insurance companies. Okay, let's give an example of us. Okay, here's how it goes when it comes to the doctor's fees. The insurance companies say that the doctor's fees, the most expensive things are procedures, then there are consultations. Doctors charge too highly for consultations. Inpatient visits, outpatient visits, and then laboratory and diagnostic services. As in, this is where the doctors are eating from the insurance companies. And the insurance companies do not want them to eat anymore. Because, as they say, uh, healthcare has become a loss-making venture for them. So that's a big problem, right? 
and you can understand them because they want to make a lot of a lot of cash and you can also understand the patients as in they they are spending too much on them they have to ask for donations and for everything and so that will give you an idea of why guys want this stuff to reduce just to speak more about the insurance companies right they have labeled doctors fees as unnecessary they actually say that these high fees are unnecessary they are charging too much above the market price right as a certain section right it will cost 120000 as per doctor's fees alone then they'll put an, a, a figure an aesthetic fees then they'll put a figure on the nurse then they'll put a figure on equipment and then they'll put other figures on other bills so they at the end of the day the insurance companies they're paying too much for this for this stuff right okay they say that they want to provide insurance for all of for as many kenyans as possible to increase from the 1.3 million or from the 2 million to as many kenyans as possible but they can't do that when it's a loss making venture when doctors fees are too high when the prices for drugs are too high they want some reprieve and they feel that this reduction of fees is a reprieve right again they also say that <clears throat> when when they when <clears throat> they incur so many costs so many expenses to cater to these medical bills and all those kind of stuff then they have to charge higher premiums and that means with charging higher premiums then only a certain section of kenyans would afford it and they actually remind people uh 74 percent of kenyans earn less than fifty thousand a month right for me what i saw a good insurance ca cover would would start from around eight thousand per year or nine thousand per year right and so unless you're earning that kind of figure as in, in affording insurance would be a bit expensive and that's why they actually say that it's a luxury for most people and even though they want to provide it then the government has to help them in terms of pharmaceutical drugs and in terms of of doctor's fees right so what does the government say about this thing we found that the patients are hurting the insurance companies are hurting what is the government saying okay what is the position of the government is it hurting as well so i have found some statistics right the government spends around okay kenya not the government Kenya spends around 234 billion on health related expenditures yearly. That's a lot of cash. It actually translates to 7% of our GDP, right? It's more than the total value of agriculture plus revenues from tourism and some other sectors, right? So if agriculture is bringing a lot of it's so important for economy and it's bringing this amount of cash right we're spending uh, let's say it's bringing this amount of cash then healthcare is taking that cash away right and plus taking cash away from tourism remember that healthcare expenses they are not they are not sort of like a, an investment that brings returns right it's actually a cost an incurred cost and you'll never see returns from that but you'll be healthy which is kind of like a return right but it's not developmental you can't put a rate of return on it 12 percent three percent or whatever <clears throat> so the government is actually it you would see why it would have some concern when it comes to the healthcare sector it would it would not want a certain sector that's only taken away from the economy to represent such a large percentage right of our uh of our of our gdp right it doesn't make sense they need to do something about it and perhaps that's one of the reasons why it has come up with this 20 percent right again i also wanted to just to add an, another thing who owns jubilee insurance and uh, this doctor's fees if it helps insurance companies will it help the person who owns jubilee insurance what if that person is uhuru kenyatta you'd actually see another reason why pushing this doctor's the cap on doctor's fees is important too that person or something so anyway let me just go to the doctor's side let, let me speak about the doctors because we've seen how patients suffer we've seen how insurance companies are suffering we've seen why the government would actually want to do something about it and we've actually seen why some people in government would want something done about it right but what about the doctors who's talking about the doctors right so anyway when it comes to the doctors some statistics that were given uh, in the private sector in Kenya, doctors usually have a rate of return that's 17%, right? 
that's kind of like the profit they make from all their ex activities. They make around 17% worth of, of profit on average, right? Now, let's take Aga Khan Hospital as an example. This was actually, I think it was a medic who wrote this, this, <clears throat> these statistics, right? And I think it was from Aga Khan. And let me just give you a breakdown of how it works, right? 3% of their surplus, they spend it on revenue, on, on welfare, free medical camps, and treatment for patients who have cancer and all those kind of things, right? Now, they treat patients with cancer mostly because I think as a way of training uh, their staff, so it's not about social welfare only, it's about training their staff. They do that also as a way of, uh, okay, as a way of, uh, <clears throat> like the free medical camps, a way of marketing their institution, right? Because you'd remember Aga Khan, and when now you have cash, you'll go to Aga Khan or something. So they don't do it purely for for welfare purposes, but still, they do it. And still, people benefit for it, from it. Now, 10.5%, it goes to training of specialists, right? Like I was surprised, I'm a dermatologist. It takes 12 years to train those guys. 12 years to train those guys. And there's some of the highest paid people, the skin some of the highest paid people in the medical profession. I never knew that. But it takes a lot of money and private institutions are actually spending cash training people, right? And then 2.5% for Aga Khan, it goes to bad debts. 3.5% it goes to servicing loans. What's the total? The total of that comes to 19.5%. And do you remember uh, their surplus? It's 17% on average. So let's say Aga Khan has uh, a surplus that's more than the average for, let's say, the, the medical pr practitioners in the private health sector, right? Let's say even 25% or 20%, right? It still means that they have a low percentage of profit. It's low. It's not as high as we'd want to believe or as we think it is, right? Especially for formalized institutions, right? that have to answer to somebody or answer nationally. Like if something goes wrong in Aga Khan, the PR nightmare would be excessive. But we have somebody like uh, Dr. Wairimu, right? He does so many bad things, but he's still alive. He's still there. He's still doing his thing, walking around and all of those things. So, and especially when you bring in doctor's fees, it will affect these formal institutions and perhaps it will won't affect the, the other guys, the... The other guys who operate within, let's say, the underground doctors, right? Because they charge, they steal from their patients in other ways. They don't charge the maximum, like the, the figures the government has for the maximum. They charge, let's say, in between, but it's still exorbitant for those people at that level, right? So these things, it's, the maximum, it won't help as such because it will help. Not everybody goes to these top institutions that charge a lot, that charge the maximum. And those who go there, they can actually afford it. So when you cap the maximum and the average remains high, you're not really helping. But anyway, that's just one of the points that I had. So anyway, the profit margins are razor thin according to this author, right? And so they have to go for operational efficiency, like reducing costs as much as possible, right? So th I think this one is mostly applies to the formal institutions because as you remember the Dr. Warimu stories, they don't really care about operational efficiency operational they don't really care about that <clears throat> unfair competition from the government that was cited again as a problem for the for the medical world because how do you compete for somebody who's offering free services right you can't compete with them so the only way you can compete with them is by focusing on quality as opposed to the free service that they're having over there and you focus on quality, that means you have to have higher trained people, better equipment, right? And better rates of success. And if you have all of those, then you have to charge highly, more than that, that institution, right? More than the, actually the market price. Leave alone the free price, but the market price. You have to charge highly more than that, right? So when the government now pushes you down that you can't charge highly, and still you can't compete with it because it's offering free services, then what is it telling you? It's simply telling you to get out of business. Because then how do you compete against that? Right? And you can't charge as these other guys in the local dispensaries or whatever charge. Right? 
because you have more standards to adhere to. Those guys, they don't have those standards to adhere to, right? And then how do, again, how do you encourage those guys at the bottom to, to come up if the price for coming up is not, it's not a good price. Anyway, so just trying to, to, to finish up. So these prices were introduced and immediately the Kenya Medical Association, it says, it said this, right? The fees were rushed. Like the 20% reduction, it was rushed. And input from the, profession, from the professionals was not considered. That's what the Kenya Medical Association was saying, right? So this was the response, right, from the K Medical Practitioners and Dentist Board Chairman. He said that the de doctors had attended the forum. I think forum for, for discussing these matters. So attending a forum, does it translate into actual studies? Like when you reduce, you reduce uh, the maximum for procedures, how will it affect the medical industry? Will it lead to growth in the medical industry? Or will it lead to a deterioration of services? Now, not only in the, let's say the public sector already has bad services, but now it will lead to a deterioration of services in the private sector as well. So generally the healthcare sector in Kenya in terms of quality will drop. Okay, so just, again, I think if you've been watching my videos, the government does these things without research, without actual research. It just implements some policies, some policies to make people feel good. Because now we'll feel good because they, they have reduced their medical expenses and stuff. So the question that I ask, if this thing impacts do doctors negatively, right? If they, if like we say the margins are low, right? They are already low as they are. And then the, the, the Kenyan government is ensuring that they don't get as much cash, right? As they would have wanted, right? So what would happen to them? Because they need to survive, right? So this is what I had. There'll be no incentive for honesty, right? Like I was talking with a friend, with some friends of mine. They were telling me about cesarean section, right? That People, doctors actually advocate for cesarean section, right, for the money. They actually do that for the money. If, because I think my, my friend, what he, he did was that a certain hospital recommended cesarean section. They went to another one, I think a mission hospital. There was no such recommendation, right? And they did it normal delivery. Because now doctors will be trying to improve their, their margins because they are already low. And they'll do that mostly at the lower level. The people will suffer mostly at those at the lower level. Because those doctors can get away with it. The doctors at Aga Khan, Nairobi Hospital, whatever, they can't get away with such things. So this, uh, this policy, ironically, it will hurt the people who are at the bottom mostly, right? Because even without the caps on maximum, and me, uh, on maximum, they were still hurting. And now since there will be no like incentive for guys to to move higher, provide higher services and charge highly so that you can get as much cash as possible, then they just, they just continue as they were continuing. <clears throat> okay, so just to add on that, there'll be no incentive for staying within the country. Like if you're not as, if you're not an unscrupulous person, if you are scrupulous and you will not do certain things to get as much money as possible, like trying to scheme off insurance companies, then why would you stay in Kenya? You'll just go out of Kenya to get more cash outside of Kenya, right? Because as soon as the government starts capping on staff, right, limiting the amount of cash that you think you deserve, right, that you think that other guys can pay for it, then you'll go elsewhere where you feel that you're getting value for, for all the years of training that you, that you did. And then there's no incentive for improving the quality of service in Kenya. Because one of the best ways of incentivizing guys to improve the quality of, of, of healthcare is by giving people cash. Money is a great incentive, right? And that's the way it works. So anyway, I believe that these kind of policies, they will lead to the quality of medical healthcare in Kenya will drop significantly because of such policies. I believe that will also have a dependence on foreigners for healthcare provision. Because if the margins are already low for, let's say, like the hospitals, 
and they use some of that surplus to train doctors and all those kind of things. And now they can't do that. So what will they will do instead of spending cash to train people, they just import people who have already been trained. It's cheaper. If it wasn't cheaper, we wouldn't be importing Cuban doctors. Again, that Cuban deal was the worst deal I've ever seen. You guys have 100 doctors coming in, you go and train 50 people. The replacement rate is not there. It is a very good deal for Cuba. Okay, so the one thing I forgot to mention, that the government uh, provides free services. Uh, procedures are kind of like the best things that uh, these guys get a lot of cash from, from procedures, right? From consultations and all of those things. Uh, the other, <clears throat> the stuff that, the, okay, they get a lot of cash on certain procedures or, or on, on certain services, right? And the government is competing with them on those kind of like procedures, on those kind of uh, things, right? So they're left with this other stuff like, okay, from what I got, they are left with the diagnostics, right? I'll do more research on that. I don't have enough information on that. I'm not a medic. This topic, I brought it because a friend of mine asked me to bring it back to to talk about it. I think we defer on my friend on this one, but I think I'll leave it at, at there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.